Hi there, Riverland. Hope you're well today as I uh, try to pull into focus on uh, February 2nd, Tuesday, what uh, I did yesterday well, in my classes up in Brainerd. It's a full week, so I got to get three videos your way. And uh, I hope everything is good, good with you. We got a cold snap um, coming. Straightforward video, no frills, no dancing, no music. And uh, my challenge is that we, in my classes yesterday, my comp twos, my nine and my 11, we, we had some conversations about Antigone. It's hard to um, uh, convey that. Uh, um, a little business note before I get going here today. I'm, I'm so overwhelmed. But I've never had a, a heavier load than this. And I'm so grateful because there's so many people in the, in the pandemic and the time of trials are, are out of work and uh, the opposite has happened um, with me and one of the hazards is it's hard to forget what I've hard to remember what I've said where to whom and um, I might be repeating the idea to you but I'm gonna need a little bit of your help in the um, soon I think and it has to do with the idea that um, once in a while I present at conferences and I haven't done I was supposed to present at the Minnesota Council of Teachers of English last spring I was going to put a presentation forth in Duluth called uh, Son of How to Host a Great American Poet, but that got canceled along with everything. And I threw my hat in the ring uh, for a, a large conference, like an, an international conference on technology and educators. And I, I, I threw my hat in the ring for fun and for irony. I'm an evangelist for the classroom. I can't wait to get back to face-to-face -face teaching. Although I have some fears that that might not happen. And the idea of me, and I've done it before, the idea of me presenting at a conference on tech um, doesn't make that much sense. But it's about you. It's about y you and me and my efforts to try to provide content, course content with YouTube. My conference title is called uh, Life in the Time of Trials, full colon, a middle-aged English major attempts to teach with YouTube. You've got to have a colon and a title if you're if you're academic. And I'm going to report on what this experience has been like, I'm trying to uh, get gear to you through YouTube and learning about the camera and learning about editing. And wh why would I need your help? Well, somewhere along the line here, even though the conference is always out April 2nd, I don't know how many people I'm going to be presenting to virtually. I'm going to need a little bit of feedback from you on what this has been like, is like, um, to take content in this way. Uh, we, we have face-to-face -face classes, we have live online classes, we have synchronous live classes, like my Zoom classes with CLC. We have um, asynchronous, right, where teachers just post up work, and then we have this, which I don't think a lot of people are doing, at least not in 4K glory like me. So. I think that can keep. Maybe it'll be a journal entry soon. Um, and I'm going to need you to be honest, too. If, if, if you're cool with this, if you like it, I want to hear, importantly, why. And if you don't like it, if you'd rather not watch my uh, vids to, to take a class, I understand that, too. But help, help, me, help me with the why. And I will be reporting uh, during that conference presentation, possibly to hundreds of people. I have no idea on what your, what your experience has, has been. My dean said something a little ominous to us in the liberal arts uh, meeting up in Brainerd the other day. She said, Zoom's probably going to be part of our lives f forever. Okay, well, I'm going live in August, I think. I'm going back to my classroom. Does that mean I'm still going to be on Zoom? Um, uh, anyway, possibly wasting your time. Uh, here's an idea for you. Recently in Brainerd, when I do my comp ones in the fall, I hear about the idea that there's a teacher up there, or teachers, maybe you've heard of this too, that say, when I say to the class, okay, what's an essay? Define an essay for me. There's always a kid in the room in recent years who will blurt out, an essay is a sandwich. And I'm like, okay, here we go, the sandwich metaphor, right? Slice of bread, three body paragraphs, and then the, the, the other slice, um, which is the conclusion. We've been here before. You write an introductory paragraph uh, that states the thesis. Then you have three body paragraphs, three points, never two, never four, just three. And then a conclusion that reiterates the thesis, which is just uh, so overtaught and so overdone uh, that there are um, 
I don't even want to go into it today. And yet, as unhappy as I am with that metaphor, we have kind of a, a sandwich of a class coming your way. I'd like to get going with an extraordinary poet and teacher and translator who's a, a true genius, whose name is Ann Carson. She's on my mind today. And um, I've got some things I want to tell you about her. Uh, so we'll start with a poem by her. Uh, I want to report on what my classes talked about yesterday, a few points that they made, a few points that I made. And then we'll circle around back uh, to Ann Carson, and she'll be my outro, so to speak, today. And I want to tell you right away that a Ann Carson is one of the most uh, unusually eccentric people I've ever met uh, in my life. And her books are really strange, and I'm gonna show, I'll show a couple uh, to you in a minute. And her, her poetry is just crazy. I mean, it is just, it can be very, very difficult and super weird. And, and that's important sometimes, I think, to confront art, to experience art that is, really makes you um, off, off kilter, off balance. Um, art that's hard uh, can really, even art that makes us uncomfortable, um, I think is important. And what I'm doing here is landing on, a, you know, you, if, if you pick up her book, Men in the Hours, and turn the pages, it's just one weird poem after another. And then all of a sudden you open this page, and it's a, a, a poem that's understandable. And it's called Father's Old Blue Cardigan. And it's about her dad, who was taken by Alzheimer's, and she really loved him. This is, this is a sad one, so get ready. Ann Carson, Father's Old Blue Cardigan. <coughs> Excuse me. Now it hangs on the back of the kitchen chair, where I always sit, as it did on the back of the kitchen chair, where he always sat. I put it on whenever I come in, as he did, stamping the snow from his boots. I put it on and sit in the dark. He would not have done this. Coldness comes paring down from the moon bone in the sky. His laws were a secret, but I remember the moment at which I knew he was going mad inside his laws. He was standing at the turn of the driveway when I arrived. He had on the blue cardigan with the buttons done up all the way to the top, not only because it was a hot July afternoon, but the look on his face as a small child who has been dressed by some aunt early in the morning for a long trip on cold trains and windy platforms will sit very straight at the edge of his seat while the shadows like long fingers over the haystacks that sweep past keep shocking him because he is riding backwards. I can't believe I didn't put on a blue cardigan to read that poem for you. I have one. So, to repeat the idea, you know, when you show up to, in a class as a teacher, the real question is who's read? And every class is full of readers and non-readers, and I love them both. And at the same time, if students don't read and don't prepare for a regular class, you're in, you're in trouble. Um, I'm a mime act without it in real life, before life. And so I, I beamed into Zoom yesterday to my 9 and my 11 comp 2s, same as yours, um, material-wise, curious, wondering, okay, who's going to talk to me and who isn't? Often, if you have three or four classes, it just seems like fate is for sure going to give you one quiet class. But both of my classes yesterday talked to you, and I was very proud of them, really proud of them. We had um, many students, many women, spoke up in admiration of Antigone for standing her ground uh, against Creon. And we had some uh, talk of that and the strangeness of Haman, who she doesn't seem very interested in, and uh, the, the tension between uh, her and her sister. Ismene, um, I no longer describe as a wimp. She, you know, who doesn't want to stay alive? Ismene's nervous. And Antigone's like, you know what, we're doing this. I'm going to do it alone if you don't help me. And she, she, she does. She um, does the unthinkable. I was wondering, too, before the class started, if they would want to vilify Creon right away. And they did. Some students said, yeah, he's, he's kind of a jerk. But we all conceded. He's got a, a, a job to do. So I had a few, um, a few questions for them um, to get them thinking. One of them had to do with Antigone. Is she a martyr? Um, if you die for a cause, isn't that, is that not martyrdom? 
Well, I'm not sure. I, I have a, had a Muslim friend years ago who told me one day when we were walking at St. John's University, he said something very simple, and I wonder if it's true. He said, you don't choose martyrdom. Martyrdom chooses you. And uh, I don't know if we can apply that to Antigone or not. I had a question, too, about Creon, because for me, there's only one plot in literature. In all of literature, the only plot that matters for me is the working out of salvation uh, or condemnation. I, you know, I, I'm, when I pick up a story, I'm like, okay, who's going to be saved? Who's going to make it? Who's going to be redeemed? And who is it? Who is going to be consigned to, uh, you know, being, being condemned? And that was among my questions. When Creon at the last minute is like, wait a minute, wait a minute, I will relent. I will bend as his son, Haman, Hyman, however you say that, begs him to. Hyman says more than once, if you don't bend, you're going to break, man. And he does. Well, does he do it in time? Is he, is he at least partially redeemed? Well, it's a little late. Um, most of my students decided yesterday. And yet, I, um, again, a bunch of people spoke up in both sections. The little Zoom squares were lighting up. And I'm like, look at you guys go. I was proud of them. How proud I am. Not of them. Proud for them. And uh, I just I wanted to tell you those things. I also uh, chimed in a little bit on my own. I wanted a uh, few uh, Jeff Johnson ideas floating in the uh, discussion. Nothing makes me happier than when students are talking with me, and more importantly, talking with one another. I just love it when I hear a student say, well, going, going off on what this person said, or building on that idea. No, it's just somebody pinched me. 34 years, and I've just never, I've just only begun to appreciate great discussions. The fancy word is called dialectic, where you talk and talk and talk and talk until you get to the bottom of something. In the olden days, there weren't bells uh, that uh, would tell you the class was over. You, you talked. You had that conversation until you got it all dialed in. But what I chimed in was a, a couple of things. You can't really see them. I could show them to you, I guess. I've already shown you this photograph. But this saint over my shoulder here, Stephen B. Humphrey, I suppose it's kind of blurry with my dreamy camera. That's a, my great professor that taught me when I was experiencing Antigone for the first time, 1978 that in, in literature we have a couple different kinds of characters. According to him, this is a 20th century guy, um, his, his argument was that we have characters who are conventional, who follow the rules, who follow the conventions. They do what they're supposed to do within the rules and values and norms of the day. And Humphrey also allowed for a far more interesting but also more dangerous character. And that is the character who is natural, quote unquote. The natural man, the natural person, to make it gender inclusive, is the character who kind of like Antigone says, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do what's in my heart. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set up my own code of conduct, my own rules for behavior. Um, come, what, come, what, come what may. Shame the devil, as we used to say in this country. I don't like that phrase. I don't know why I used it. That, that's her story. She's like, your, your rules and your laws mean nothing to me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to follow something different. Or to put it another way, your civic laws uh, have no bearing on my life because I'm going to obey, at least on the surface, ostensibly, religious obligations. There's a tension between the secular and the religious. So I put that before them. I also, to make certain that they didn't totally think that Creon was a jerk, I wanted them to realize, you know what? Um, he has a job to do, and he's nervous. They called him fearful. I had a very smart student, Tristan, yesterday said, Creon's driven by fear. He's afraid the mob's going to rise up uh, against him. And there was some talk there of comparing Creon to Pontius Pilate, uh, who knew Jesus was innocent. But in that story, whether you look at it as real or as world literature, he decides to wash his hands of that moment. He wants to stay in charge. He does not want to lose political power. Creon's the same way. And to try to bring it to bear on their lives, my young students yesterday, all of them younger than me, and many of them extra young, I uh, let them know that they are headed for days where they're going to have authority over other people. And, they're, and they need to prepare for that day. And I had some fun with a sweet woman named Nalana Dosh, who's back with me. She took a class from me at CLC, and I, she's really smart. She was in the middle of the screen. I'm like, Nalana. Are you prepared for the day that you're going to be authoritative or have authority over other people? And she smiled. She's so sweet. And she's like, um, I'm 17. I'm like, I know Nalana Dosh, 
but the day after tomorrow, and because I know how bright you are, you're going to probably be running a corporation. You're going to be a CEO. You, you, you're a CEO. You're going to fire people. And we had this goof around moment where I said, I want you to fire me right now. Practice. And we, we did like, like a, a play acting skit in front of the other students. And I said, and she's like, okay, let's do it. And I said, okay, I'm knocking on your door. Uh, Miss Dosh, I got your email that you wanted to see me. And she sat me down and, well, pretty quickly she fired me. And uh, then we had a little fun with euphemism, right? You never say to someone you're firing, I'm firing you. You say, you know, I'm sorry to report to you, we're reorganizing. Uh, we are, uh, um, or to say even worse, you're not getting fired. I'm providing you with a new opportunity elsewhere. So I, you, you guys got to be ready for that too. And I, I ended that little segment by letting them know, hey, the easiest way to teach a class, uh, like say you're in charge of a bunch of fifth graders, the way to do it, if you want to make it easy on yourself, just be a fascist like Creon. And uh, things are pretty simple then. They knew I was kidding, and they knew that I would never run a, a classroom um, like that. So... Let's get to the other uh, end of our sandwich here with, with Ann Carson. I want to tell you a few things. A Ann Carson translated Antigone, and I'll prove that to you in a moment here. But first, a couple stories. My friend Mark Conway, when I was still at St. John's, hosted uh, the great poet and translator and teacher, uh, Ann Carson. And he wanted me to help him with the reading. And my help was mainly putting like giant sheets of paper over this window because we were going to have the reading that night down in this uh, place where the orchestra uh, practiced in the Benedictine Arts Center. So I was outside with duct tape and paper and we wanted it as dark as possible. And I could not have been happier on that beautiful uh, fall day. And the, the poetry reading was one of the weirdest readings I've ever been to. I mean, I got to meet her ahead of time. Uh, she was wearing these red glasses and and it, the, it, she was, it was dark, and she had a microphone, and maybe a hundred people there, and she was, there was a big, she likes to have screens above her, as you'll see. She likes something going on on a screen when she does the reading. And there were dancers, there were modern dancers up there, dancing, you know, in a really modern, dancing way, and I, it was hard to tell. And she also had a recording going of her reading poetry. And on top of that, she was singing, and on top of that, she was reading poetry live. And it was really hard, because of the darkness in the room, to tell when she was reading and when that was a recording of her reading. And I just stood there going, this is, this is genius, but this is also super, super weird. I want to bring her to Brainerd. I've got a holster. She's 70 years old. I still have time. She's got nine years on me. And I, I don't care, I guess, thinking right now. If the whole crowd is just sitting there blinking, I'll be happy. And the day after that reading, um, my friend Mark called me and said, Hey, Ann Carson wants to see the eagle's nest. I said, That's fantastic. Bring her over. And my friend Mark came over with Ann Carson and her husband, Robert Curry. And we walked. We trespassed for an hour and a half on the farm next door. She hardly said a word. She was so quiet and shy. And then later, my friend Mark said, Hey, she really liked you. And Robert Curry, uh, who you'll meet in a minute, too, uh, he, he showed me his hand when we were done walking, and he, he said, what's this? And I said, that, that right there, that's a, that's a wood tick. <laughs> this guy's from the East. He's an Englishman, actually. He flipped out. He's like, I've got to use your bathroom. And he used the bathroom, and um, he had to. I'm looking into the bathroom where he went. Why would I do that? He had to make sure that there were no other wood ticks on him. And I laughed, and it was um, great to meet him. No, oh, dang it, I remembered I don't have my book. Hang on just a second. Man, I bet that really was just a second to you. Uh, so many books, it's hard to keep track of them. Um, hang on here, I'm almost, I'm getting there, I'm almost done. Um, Ann Carson's books are super weird. Like, this one looks kind of normal. Look at this one. It's plastic, it's called Float. And it's in a plastic case, and you pick it up, and it's really just tons of, like, chapbooks. Um, and that's, that's, that is unusual. Here's another book I bought of hers years ago. It's called Knox. It was like 30 bucks, and I bought it, and I'm like, what is this, a book in a box? Well, this is a book about her brother Knox, who um, 
ran away from Canada because he got on, in trouble uh, dealing drugs and he ran away to Europe. The family never heard from him for years. This whole book is just like a, it's like an accordion, right? I've, I've never known quite how to, how to read this book. I tried it once, just putting it in my lap. I guess it's really so hard to show things on a camera. I've imagined, like in my brain, my big classroom in Brainerd, there's a huge table, long table, and I can pull it out so they can all see it, and students are marveling. You know, there's little poems, little bits of translations, and um, photographs, drawings. And, um, but I really admire her, and I got all, I've got all her books. Um, two more things today. I feel like I'm degrading a little bit. I want to read just one paragraph from her collection, Plain Water, and from a portion of the book called The Anthology, Anthropology of Water. And I'd like to um, read this in honor of Antigone, because it's kind of a gender battle, you guys. It's a man and a woman arguing. And then I'm going to turn you loose on um, a little bit of a, a video uh, thing that I'll explain. Um, anyway, oh, this is also in honor of any man that might be taking this course that might someday be trying to get along with a woman. Or conversely, a woman uh, trying to get along with a man. This is about her dad, too. Man is this, and woman is that. Men do this, and women do different things. Woman wants one thing, and man wants something else. And nobody down the centuries appear to understand, appears to understand how this should work. Every day, he'd come in from the fields and throw his old filthy hat on my clean tablecloth that we're going to eat off. Sweat man down, says my mother, still furious. And he's been gone how long? Years now. Let's end with Ann Carson's strangeness. Um, I'm going to pull in about 10 minutes of this uh, video for you of her putting on and staging her translation of Antigone with what appears to be Scandinavians in some school, I think, in Georgia. And you'll see a screen above her glowing. Now, by reader's theater, I mean it's not acting on a stage, per se. You'll see in a minute that there's a number of actors that are going to come forward holding texts, holding the text. In other words, this is not theater theater, but read, reader's theater. And try not to gloss over when she reads her introduction to Antigone, which is in the form of a letter uh, to Antigone. The, the, the freakiest thing about the letter to me was thinking about all the different ways that Antigone has been staged across the years. And it chills my heart a little bit to think of what's true. Nazi uh, German officers went to see regularly concerts and works of the theater. And Antigone was put on for them, apparently in Paris, uh, maybe 1944, I can't remember the year. And it's a very strange thing for me to think of monsters uh, in uniforms, who one minute are exterminating um, Jews and Catholics and gay people, and the next minute are just like, you know, going to the theater on a glass of champagne. That's just, a, that's a jarring idea for me. It make, it's hard. That's a hard idea for me. But here's the thing. Try to give this about 10 minutes, and if you want to watch the whole thing, just Google it. Just Google Ann Carson and Ant 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 Antigonique, uh, I think is how she translated uh, the name. One more thing, in addition to her and a bunch of Scandinavians, you're going to hear uh, another character introduced. Nick, a mute part, always on stage. He measures things. That's actually her husband, Robert Curry. Uh, he's always performing with her. And you're going to, if you give it a little bit of a chance, past the introduction, you're going to see him walking around the entire time with a string, measuring things, um, measuring things, measuring characters, measuring faces, measuring distances between characters. And when I show this live in Brainerd, as I have for a number of years, students are just like, what is he measuring? And I always say, oh, justice. Severus Skywalker, I'm not sure if we'll have a quote today. Let me think about that. Um, I'm going to give you t maybe 10 minutes of this. And uh, you've got a quiz up, and you've also got a, a reading up uh, that I just put up this morning, um, because all I do all day long is... <laughs> Think about my students and how I can serve them best. And I uh, did my, my best today, even if I feel a little scattered. Stay safe. I love you guys.
Thank you for coming. I have a two-minute introduction to the task of the translator of Antigone. It's in the form of a letter. Dear Antigone, your name in Greek means something like against birth or instead of being born. What is there instead of being born? It's not that we want to understand everything or even to understand anything. We want to understand something else. I keep returning to Brecht, who made you do the whole play with a door strapped to your back. A door can have diverse meanings. I stand outside your door. The odd thing is, you stand outside your door too. That door has no inside. Or if it has an inside, you are the only person who cannot enter it. For the family who lives there, things have gone indescribably wrong. To have a father who was also your brother means having a mother who was your grandmother, a sister who was both your niece and your aunt, and another brother you love so much you want to lie down with him thigh to thigh in the grave, or so you say glancingly early in the play, but no one mentions it again afterwards. Oh, you always exaggerate, my father used to tell me. And let's footnote here Hegel calling woman the eternal irony of the community. How seriously can we take you? Are you Antigone between two deaths, as Lacan puts it? Or a parody of Creon's law and Creon's language? So Judith Butler, who also finds in you the occasion for a new field of the human. Then again, an exemplar of masculine intellect and moral sense is George Eliot's judgment. While to several modern scholars, you perhaps predictably sound like a terrorist. And Zizek compares you triumphantly with Tito, the leader of Yugoslavia, saying no to Stalin in 1942. Speaking of the 40s, you made a good impression on the Nazi high command and simultaneously on the leaders of the French resistance when they all sat in the audience of jean Anouy's Antigone, opening night Paris 1944. I don't know what color your eyes were, but I can imagine you rolling them now. Let's return to Brecht. Maybe he got you best. To carry one's own door will make a person clumsy, tired, and strange. On the other hand, it may come in useful if you go places that don't have an obvious way in, like normality, or an obvious way out, like the classic double bind. Well, that's your problem. My problem is to get you and your problem across into English from ancient Greek. All that lies hidden in these people, your people, crimes and horror and years together, a family, what we call a family. One of my earliest memories, wrote John Ashbery in New York Magazine 1980, is of trying to peel off the wallpaper in my room, not out of animosity, but because it seemed there must be something fascinating behind its galleons and globes and telescopes. This reminds me of Samuel Beckett, who described in a letter his own aspirations toward language to bore hole after hole in it until what cowers behind it seeps through. Dear Antigone, you also are someone keeping faith with a deeply other organization that lies just beneath what we see or what we say. To quote Creon, you are autonomos, a word made up of autos, self, and nomos, law. Autonomy sounds like a kind of freedom, but you aren't interested in freedom. Your plan is to sew yourself into your own shroud using the tiniest of stitches. How to translate this? I take inspiration from John Cage, 
who, when asked how he composed 433, answered, I built it up gradually out of many small pieces of silence. <laughs> Antigone, you do not, any more than John Cage, aspire to a condition of silence. You want us to listen to the sound of what happens when everything normal, musical, careful, conventional, or pious is taken away. O oh, sister and daughter of Oedipus, who can be innocent in dealing with you, there was never a blank slate. We are already anxious about you. Perhaps you know that Ingeborg Bachmann poem from the last years of her life that begins, I lose my screams. Dear Antigone, I take it as the task of the translator to forbid you should ever lose your screams. We will now begin. Cast, Antigone. Mali. Ismene, sister of Antigone. Metamostrup. Creon, king of Thebes. Nielsen. Hymon, son of Creon and Eurydice. Marcin Larsen. Eurydice, wife of Creon, mother of Hymon. Pia Jul. Tiresias, blind prophet of Thebes, led by a boy. Pike Malinowski. Boy. Peter Højrup. Guard. Peter Højrup. Messenger. Amelia Smith. Chorus of old Theban men. Anne Carson. Nick, a mute part, always on stage. He measures things. Set, palace of Creon at Thebes. Enter Antigone and Ismene. We begin in the dark, and birth is the death of us. Who said that? Hegel. Sounds more like Beckett. He was paraphrasing Hegel. I don't think so. Whoever it was, whoever we are, dear sister, ever since we were born from the evils of Oedipus, what bitterness, pain, disgust, disgrace, or moral shock have we been spared? And now this edict. You've heard the edict. I've heard no edict. That our two brothers are dead by one another's hands and the Argive army gone from this city is all I know. That's what I thought. That's why I called you out here. What's the matter? You have your thunder look. Creon is resolved to honor one of our brothers with burial, the other not. Eteocles, he has led in the ground in accordance with justice and law. Polynices is to lie unwept and unburied Sweet, sorry meat for the little lusts of the birds. Noble Creon draws our attention to this edict. Yours and my attention. Whoever transgresses it gets death. So, what do you say? What could I say? What could I do? If you join me, if you join my action. At what risk? Where is your mind? If you help me, help me lift the corpse. Creon says, Unlawful to do so. Antigone says unholy not to. Oh, sister, don't cross this line. Dear sister, my dead are mine, and yours as well as mine. Whoever we are, think, sister, father's daughter, daughter's brother, sister's mother, mother's son. His mother and his wife were one. Our families double, triple, degraded and dirty in every direction. Moreover, we too are alone. And we are girls. Girls cannot force their way against men. Yet I will. Sweet sister, you aim too high. True sister, yet how sweet to lie upon my brother's body thigh to thigh. Your heart so hot, thou sister. 
O oh, one and only head of my sister, whose blood intersects with my own in too many ways. The dead are cold. They'll welcome me. You're a person in love with the impossible. And when my strength is gone, I'll stop. It's wrong. Don't say that or I'll have to hate you. He will hate you too. Just let me go. For I'll not endure anything so grievous as what robs me of a noble death. Go then, but no, you go as one beloved, although you go without your mind. Exit Antigone and Ismene. Enter Chorus. <laughs> <laughs> 